Welcome to Utahamu Africa, a podcast about life and politics on the African continent. I'm Kim Dion, one of your hosts, and I'm joined by my co-host, Rachel Baby Rito. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Kim, and hello, listeners. So this week, we hope, is your long-anticipated moment where Kim and I catch up on what's happened in 2023, and we look ahead to 2024, what's happening and what it means. Now, for all of our listeners around around the world, um, we know that 2024 is poised to be a really significant year. It is the biggest global election year in history. Over 4 billion people, more than half of the world's population, will head to the polls for elections in one form or another, whether for presidents and executives or subnational elections. And that also means that more than 60 countries will participate in these elections. In Africa, and that means 22 countries will be holding elections this year. And of course, we know that means varied opportunities, varied levels of competitiveness, of democratic participation, varied levels of citizens' ability to assemble, um, to be represented equally in the selection and conduct of government. This is the contours of democratic contestation um, around the world. And, and something that as we head to elections in the United States as well in 2024, we're looking at very carefully. But here we're thinking about how elections do provide potentially this focal point around which mobilization can occur. Surprises can happen in one direction or another. And so it's a really significant year ahead. So Kim, thinking about that, what stands out to you when we look to 2024? Well, so I I actually, because there were so many elections happening and because you know, we've been talking a lot about democracy and elections in the last few episodes of our show, um, I, was, I was trying to look at where are the places that are having elections in Africa in 2024. Um, you know, there's some big ones, of course, South Africa having an election and, um, you know, Ghana being on the same electoral cycle as the United States and, um, you know, also being a two-party system. I've been following their elections over the years. Um, But what was a real help for me to understand and kind of think about continent-wide the elections happening, I actually went to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Um, they have a great primer on all of the elections that are pending in 2024 on the continent. And, um, you know, actually one has already happened. So I don't know if you have followed what's happened in Comoros, which is this archipelago of islands, um, you know, one of these like island African nations. Um, so there's three main islands. And, and the reason why I was wondering if you were following it is because this is a place where term limits have been um, debated, right? So, you know, before there were term limits and in fact, there was this really um, kind of a stability in the country, a peace and stability in the country um, because of an agreement about alternation. So across these three islands, there would be like, you know, the president would be someone representing from one of each of these islands kind of in turn, right? And after years of military coups, right, this decision to have this rotation across the three islands, three main islands, um, that decision brought stability for many years. Um, Of course, that gets undone in 2018 with a referendum. And um, so what we see, you know, the first African Mm -hmm. election in 2024 is this Comorin presidential election um, where the incumbent president, of course, wins. Um, so for those who didn't know, the incumbent president, Azali Asimani, was reelected with almost 63% of the vote um, in these January elections in Comoros. But turnout was low. It was only 16%. Um, and this was because many opposition candidates had boycotted the elections. Um, and, and, you know, 16% turnout um, you know, that it's, it's remarkable. Uh, that's down from 54% turnout in, um, the previous presidential election in, in 2019. Um, this constitutional referendum that changed a lot of the electoral rules in Comoros happened in 2018. So 2019 was the first time that, um, Asimani had run for re-election, you know, because before he wouldn't have been allowed to do it without this 2018 referendum. Um, so turnout was uh, 54% in 2019, 
but it was turnout was even higher in the previous presidential election, right? In 2016, it was 69%. So we're seeing this drastic decline in turnout um, over time in Comoros. And you can't help but think that it has to do with this significant change in the rules and, um, you know, what Rachel and I would recognize based on, you know, our study of democracy. Um, it's what Nancy Bermeo called in her article many years ago, executive aggrandizement, where the president, Rosalia Asmani, um, when in, during his first term, made some institutional changes that made it possible for him to have this constitutional referendum that would allow him additional terms in office, right? And then um, changing the makeup of and, and, and which courts get to decide on these kinds of things. Like, basically making sure that the executive branch of the government would have more power, ensuring the likelihood that he would then be able to run again and then win. Um, now, for these January 2024 elections, there were violent protests following the announcement um, that the incumbent um, Asumani had won the election. Um, and again, this is repeating what we saw in 2019 following the Comoros elections. Um, and I guess I don't want to start off 2024 on like a negative note um, because, you know, um, I do think that a lot of the elections that are coming up in 2024 are, um, are there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity for democracy and democrats and democratic actors and and dem democracy advocates to have. There's a lot of reasons for us to have hope, um, and um, but I think you know it's cases like this that remind us to also be vigilant and to think about, um, you know, what it means when there are rule changes and the consequences of those down the line. And, and um, I don't know if, you know, you even see many people reporting on the Comoros elections and what happens and, you know, these, these big changes. Exactly, Kim. I think when you're talking about executive aggrandizement, um, that's looking back on 2023 and the last several years, that's really one of the trends that we see and we should anticipate, you know, to continue in 2024 and thinking about, as you've just said, the ways in which that in this particular case, but replicated across the world and in, in many situations, um, affects the ability of the judicial branch to function and around candidate eligibility. That's something we've been talking a lot about in Senegal and other places um, as we look forward to elections there, for example, in 2024, the big presidential elections coming up, the way it affects the ability of the legislature to serve as a check on the executive. So that's something that we've really been thinking about in terms of Ghana, another place that's coming up with elections. And so that role of kind of democratic erosion through executive aggrandizement is something that I think there are these two counter trends when we look at an Africa, you know, across the last several years um, in terms of thinking about the rise of coups in the region, you know, particularly across West Africa and the rise of this kind of democratic erosion through institutional means, executive aggrandizement. Now, when we mention that there are uh, 22 countries that are we're looking for elections in 2024, there's also a question of whether those elections will happen. We know that in Mali, presidential elections were scheduled for February, and they've already been postponed. So that, again, kind of following this question of when and where is the institutional route followed versus Mali following the coup, the um, ruling junta, the transitional government, et cetera, the postponement of elections there, they're already in the non-institutional route to democratic erosion. Um, there's a big question about whether elections will be held in Tunisia. They're slated for presidential elections in November. But as we heard from Alex Blackman uh, just a few weeks ago, um, the, that has also been a kind of shutting down of the other branches, um, dissolving parliament, you know, rather than co-opting it or using it as a tool of, of uh, democratic erosion. So I think there are big questions here about what, of the two paths we'll see and the institutional path versus the extra institutional path. And I'll also say that that challenge we see globally and, and across the continent really coming articulated from below as well from citizens 
whether they're sticking with the institutional path and really using elections as this moment to challenge, or as you've said in Comoros, you know, the boycott. You have to say this this institutional path is not delivering. I don't believe in it. I'm not going to legitimize it by participating. You know, that the extra institutional route is in some ways, we know it's not um, going to give opposition any stakeholding in government, any kind of backbench from which to be a check or a voice. But when citizens don't see that as a viable outcome anyway, I think it's a really, it's a sign, the boycotts are a sign that people feel that their voices are so um, restricted that that's their, their kind of remaining option. So we see that kind of top down and bottom up um, across the institutional and extra institutional routes. And I think we'll continue to see that in 2024 play out. The other thing that I'll just mention is the increasing, looking back on 2023 and looking ahead to 2024, the increasing role of um, regional blocks, you know, like especially ECOWAS, thinking about the role of SADC. But ECOWAS has been playing such an interesting role, in particular in response to these coups in Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso. And we see reports that just in January, those three countries pulled out of ECOWAS. Um, in particular, um, they withdrew because of the sanctions that the group was in, imposing on them in response to those coups. So um, the as we see this kind of democratic erosion through different routes, we can expect more um, disunity from regional blocs, which are not sharing the same even kind of need to um, comply with the practice of elections or uh, make it look as if there are multi-party elections. And so that, I think, disunity within the regional blocs is a real um, factor to consider their weakening power, their weakening pressure. Um, whereas we've discussed, you know, in the past, Echo Was, you know, went into Gambia, um, the pressure um, for a kind of pro-democratic, pro-multi-party elections uh, used to be fairly significant. So um, these these are really changing times in terms of the ability of a coherent regional bloc to act in concert and 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 pressure any one particular member. I have to admit, Rachel, I didn't know that these Sahelian countries had pulled out of ECOWAS. So what does that mean? I mean, if there's no, like, I mean, not that ECOWAS is the savior, you know? Um, you know, of course, right, they, they've um, had some great moves in in um, the last 10 years regarding like promotion of democracy. You know, of course, we're just talking about the Gambian case in particular, but, you know, what, what recourse then is left for, you know, people who want to have elections, want to have a civilian government, want to, you know, have the power to choose who among them should serve as um, the leader of a civilian government, right, in these countries that experience these coups, you know, if not echo us, right, you know, is, does it mean that, like, you know, in places like Mali, are are we waiting for the benevolence of military leadership to actually shepherd in democracy to to return to democracy? Yeah, it's such an interesting question, especially when you think about that judicial level of an echo loss. Um, court. Right, the fact that citizens could take concerns if they weren't finding their concerns being met at the national level, citizens could go to this regional block level. And the, you know, these three countries, the military leadership left ECOWAS because they said it was betraying its founding principles and had become a threat to its member states and their people, right, through the sanctions that they were imposing. And ECOWAS says, you know, that they, um, of course, need to be able to react and, um you know, they haven't received any direct formal notification from the three member states about their intention to withdraw from the community. But these these three member states made the public statement that they were um, that they were pulling out um, because they also, again, this ties to a kind of internal external logic that we're seeing more broadly. Um, the three member states had said that ECOWAS was acting under the undue influence of foreign powers, um, which is 
perceived to be France, the United States, the UK. Um, so this ties into the kind of narrative around that Mali, Niger, Burkina, the military juntas have been portraying around a kind of anti-colonial um, influence and that the uh, democratic governments were kind of completely captured by those foreign linkages. So I think it's a really interesting question, Kim, that you pose around, like, what are the democratic outlets? How can citizens mobilize for rights? And um, whether they see that as being, I think there are some some interesting kind of sentiment questions at this level about whether or not citizens see this extra institutional route as responding to some citizen demands in the short term, if certainly not procedurally or in the long term, uh, that their democratically elected governments were, were seemingly to them at times incapable of doing, particularly in response to the kind of foreign influence and the domestic security challenges. Yeah, you know, I'm also thinking, you know, again, kind of with this historical experience of Comoros, right, which had these military coups back in the 70s or whatnot, right? And then they come up with, you know, they have a transitional government and they come up with these institutional rules to try to keep peace and stability, right? Um, and that worked for more than a decade. And then one guy becomes president, right? And engages in this whole, you know, we're talking about executive aggrandizement, engages in these changes to the rules that, um, you know, change it back to, you know, that erode democracy, right? And so I wonder, if, you know, how much you're thinking about, um, you know, in these countries that have had these coups in, in the Sahel and, and elsewhere in West Africa, you know, we're hoping they're having elections this year, right? Like if, if we're counting them up, it looks like that's going to happen. But if there's, you know, these transitional governments do in fact hold elections, are there ways that they can safeguard, you know, um, a path forward? You know, I think about I think about your book a lot, Julie, um, and I'm talking about uh, Rico's first book on the, the authoritarian origins of democratic party systems. And I think about, um, you know, the cases you focus on in your book are different kinds of autocracies, right? They're, they're dictatorships where there's a personalist, right? A president who's like kind of got this big cult of personality and, and, and really like it's, um, he's the ruler of the country or it's um, these kind of hegemonic single party regimes, um, but not really military regimes and i'm not not that i want to say necessarily that the, you know but right now effectively the rulers of um these yeah. transitional governments are people in the military so i don't know um if you have thoughts about like in a country like mali right which has had a lot of security issues and stability issues um you know and and who's transitional government is is run by military officers like what what should you think about parties democracy like elections like how, how what should we be looking for what should we be hopeful about yeah such a great question kim and i i'm thinking about this a lot too and trying to draw lessons from from past cases and what we see right now so i think there are three potential paths one is where the military leaders oversee elections, elections in quote in air quotes here that our listeners can't see, um, but that just basically ensure their continued authoritarian power, right? And and that would lead to the kind of historic transition that we saw in a place like Ghana, where J.J. Rawlings came in as a military re ruler, but then institutionalized over time a party to help rule. Um, but that would not be taking us towards democracy during that that period, right? It would be maybe building out a party potentially um, that could in the future serve as a, as a democratic comp competitor. But I think there are other routes that are possible that might be more democratic. And one in particular is around whether or not the transitional military governments 
are able to oversee elections in the near term that are participatory and they're, you know, open up the field. Maybe they're still competing, right? But they're not restricting to too great of an extent other participants. There, I see the likely outcome, something much more similar to a Benin, um, where you have a very fragmented party system, where you have a lot of different flux, but that you have the ability to participate and get to a democratic contested elections here, Benin in the kind of 1990s and 2000s. Um, so I see that potential if these military governments do go towards elections, that it could be very highly contested, very participatory, and you know not um, not highly structured by these kind of dominant parties or, or um, organizations. Um, so that that is one route, and then a third route might be that the military ruling governments don't hold elections in the short term, and um, they try to institutionalize and harden their rule. Um, and, and that I think it presents much, much less of an opportunity to have the feedback around what citizens need and participation. For sure. You know, of course, it's not just, uh, these, uh, recent coup experience states that are having elections this year. So what other places are you watching on the continent? Um, I imagine Senegal is one of them, but I'm I'm curious to know what what other elections are you watching and um, and what other themes around elections and are you um, are you paying attention to? Yeah, Senegal is definitely a place that I'm watching. I think there are really high stakes there. I think there are really interesting, practical and scholarly questions about democracy, about barring candidates and candidate eligibility. You know, do we see um, this as an example of the when the courts can do the work that they need to do around um, uh, their own criminal justice proceedings and then whether or not candidates are eligible, um, or is this really a red flag? Um, so I think Senegal is a really interesting case and we'll continue to kind of have episodes on it and be listening to our former non-resident fellow, Bambandiai, over at the African Africanist uh, podcast. The other... Um, case that I think is really significant and many people's eyes are on is South Africa. You know, I think it's it's such a huge election. It's potentially likely that the ANC might lose, you know, their majority, but might be able to still rule through a kind of plurality. Um, so I think there is just so much um, kind of growing potential for um, continuing contestation and opposition, and at the same time, really deeply express citizens' grievances around governance and questions about corruption and questions that should force parties to reform and, and continue to evolve and offer, be responsive to what citizens need. So I think there, um, I think it's, it's going to be a kind of another historic transitional election for South Africa, but I'm still, you know, kind of, on Evan Lieberman's um, great book about South Africa, I remain a South Africa optimist. I still think it's this incredible, you know, opportunity. And so I, I'm hopeful that that election will continue to be a democratic outlet for accountable, good, effective governments, governance that delivers on what citizens are asking for. So Kim, what, what countries are you watching? Um, so likewise, South Africa, um, because of the challenge to the ANC, I think the rightful challenge to the ANC, certainly, uh, and, you know, they, they've played an important role in um, South Africa's history. Um, and I think being plagued by these corruption scandals um, just raises some questions about, you know, the extent to which they're going to be involved in South Africa's future. And I think, um, you know, one thing that's really interesting to me about South Africa's elections is, is how the youth will vote um, and the, the um, growing appeal of the economic freedom fighters to youth voters, right? So the EFF or this party that's, um, you know, people may know their figurehead, Julius Malema, who's this you know, firebrand um, who um, is, is um, gosh, he's quite charismatic, I think, um, you know, depending on who you are and, and the extent to which you agree with his politics. But I think, 
um, you know, the way the EFF is mobilizing, I mean, right in the name of the party, right, the economic freedom fighters, I think, you know, economic issues are really, you know, what's driving a lot of dissatisfaction with the ANC. So not just corruption, but, um, and, and I don't even think that this is peculiar to South Africa. I mean, I think in a lot of African elections, you know, people aren't just interested in um, elections for democracy or per se, but, you know, a lot of voting the bums out because their everyday lives are not improving and in fact can be worsening. Um, to be sure, some of this is happening because of you know, global economic trends and things that are out of the control of democratically elected leaders. But also, I think there's something about the political elites, you know, including, you know, former leaders of the ANC, just being woefully out of touch with ordinary voters and not taking seriously their needs and concerns. And um, it's going to come to a point where if you haven't addressed our basic living standards, we are going to go for this person who's saying a few things that are a little bit crazy, but also like it's right in the main economic freedom fighters, like apartheid, political apartheid may be older, but economic apartheid still exists, right? Opportunities have improved for black people in South Africa, but to what degree and for how many black South Africans? And I, I think, you know, it's, it's like whenever I hear economists tell me, like, oh, but poverty has gone down. Life expectancy has gone up. Everything is looking awesome. And I was like, yeah, except for the people who are still poor, except for, you know, the, the mothers who are still losing their babies at very young ages because infant mortality has gone down, but it's not zero. And there are still people who are feeling like, you know, democracy is not helping us. Um, and actually, this is, you know, one of the concerns I have um, thinking about this is, you know, um, the election of populists, right? So, you know, I talk about economic freedom fighters in um, in South Africa. Like, that's a, a party that certainly has a populist um, campaign, but uh, there are others, right? At, at the same time, of course, you know, we look to late 2023 and, you know, um, and how populism did then. I mean, George Weah lost in Liberia. Um, and he ran in 2017 on a largely populist campaign. Then he didn't deliver, right? So I guess I'm a little bit concerned about populists, except, you know, the one thing is when you're a populist and you make campaign promises that you're, you know, you're going to be different than the other guys, but you're not going to be corrupt like, you know, the guys who are in office and you're going to make sure that you know, ordinary citizens are going to get their share of a country's prosperity. Well, in the case of Liberia under George Weah, Liberians said, well, we didn't get that. So, you know, it was a close election, but the fact that he lost re-election, I think is important for us to think about, you know, the, the limits of populism. Um, <clears throat> But what's also important is that not only did George Weah lose, he conceded. And I think, um, you know, I'll be curious to see the places where losers do and do not concede. I think that there is a growing trend. Um, you know, maybe that's just my view living here in the United States where the last presidential election, you know, the guy who lost, they didn't concede. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I think we should be paying attention to um, the extent to which losers are willing to say they've lost. Absolutely, Kim. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's really key. That's the, you know, number one kind of sign of, of democratic uh, practice as well. Um, and, I want to just highlight what you were talking about in terms of South Africa and the broader sense, again, kind of looking at past trends and, and what it portends for the year ahead, is the importance of the role of the economy 
and the kind of sense of the um, the way in which that's driving voting behavior. I think we know voters are generally dissatisfied with um, a lack of, you know, real economic dividends from democracy. And that has translated to some dissatisfaction with democracy itself. And Ken Apollo actually has a really nice piece in Bloomberg um, this week and and also um, related to um, his Substack. Um, but his piece in Bloomberg is entitled kind of Africa's year of elections faces a pernicious enemy. And that is the economy. We saw the intensification over the last year, 2023, of economic woes. And in particular, we saw the debt crises and distress in Ghana and Zambia, two really important democratic actors on the continent, as they worked on restructuring their, their debts and following defaults in the previous year. Ethiopia defaulted this year. And so the way in which um, the demands on governments to provide viable livelihood enhancing infrastructure and the efficient use of debt for job creation. I think that these two um, economic factors will really, they'll play out, as you've said, in the South African case and in many places around the demands that citizens are making on governments and what they, how they need to deliver um, to make the economy work, not just for a kind of growing GDP and a small number of elite, but uh, to really meet the needs of, of the majority of citizens and to meet the needs of those um, who are the most um, in need of assistance. Now, Kim, there's one other factor about um, South Africa that I wanted to, um, to mention from, you know, such a, an important um, leader on the continent. And I know you were, you were, um, doing some reading about the kind of current status of, of South Africa's um, ICJ um, court case. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you're thinking there? Yeah, so um, we we mentioned this in, in um, a previous episode about South Africa bringing case to the International Court of Justice, right, um, charging Israel with committing genocide against Palestinians. And um, that case, uh, there was um, there was a decision um, not like so. The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, did not uh, rule that Israel has committed genocide. That's not what happened in the most in this most re recent decision. What what um, they did say was that it was plausible that Israel had violated the genocide convention. Right, so this is the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which um, was a convention that came out of you know the the um, terrible history of World War II um, and the Holocaust. Um, so the plausible violation of the Genocide Convention. Our listeners can learn more about that, that ruling from the ICJ in the case generally by reading a piece that Kelly Zopo wrote for Good Authority that we'll link in our show notes. Just kind of giving you some more background on that. We had a Again, some some other kind of resources that folks uh, could check out in our previous episodes. But one thing that really caught my eye, I don't know if you read it, Rachel, but it was just this really moving essay in the New York Times that Sean Jacobs, a professor at the New School, wrote. And so folks who don't know, Sean Jacobs, um, in addition to being a professor at the New School, is also um, the founder of Africa as a Country, which is you know, one of our favorite blogs slash like media outlets um, that that publishes lots of great work. And um, so Sean wrote about this case before um, this you know plausible violation decision had come out of the ICJ. Um, but the way he wrote about it was, you know, as an expatriate South African who's kind of you know lived a life that that um, remembers, right, the fight for um, the end of apartheid and the kind of birth of South Africa as, as a democracy. So he writes about how this diverse group of lawyers that argued South Africa's case at the ICJ represented, quote, a country whose national identity is a product of collective struggle 
and a rejection of the ethno-nationalist blood and soil politics that South Africa left behind when we defeated legal apartheid. That kind of logic seems to many of us to define Israel's policy toward Palestinians. For years, the country's now governing African National Congress has made a common cause with the Palestinians. In the international court, these South Africans were at once fighting for and helping us imagine nation had built on shared struggles and ideals rather than group identities, end quote. So I encourage our listeners to read Sean's essay. It's, it's about more than South Africa's case at the ICJ. It's also about patriotism as well as global civil society. And Sean's essay is one of hope. And the way he writes about the case shows us the power of solidarity among groups that have faced oppression and violence. Kim, thanks so much for sharing that with us. I think it's really helpful for our listeners to kind of have a sense of positioning this in a broader um, picture and and thinking about what it means um, from different perspectives and and what we can take from it. So um, we hope that this has been a, an interesting conversation for our listeners. And um, we look forward to next week introducing you all to our non-resident fellows for this season, season eight, um, who will give themselves a, a brief introduction and tell you a little bit about what they're going to be talking about um, this season for their, their interviews and their episodes. So stay tuned. And we look forward to sharing more with you throughout this coming year on the elections we've just been talking about and much, much more. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Ufahamu Africa. You can find more episodes, show notes, and transcripts on our website, ufahamuafrica.com. This podcast is produced and managed by Megan DeMint with help from production assistants, Chukwu Fananya Ikechukwu, Alex Kozak, Harry Stoltz, and Michere Muguero. Our non-resident podcast fellows are Ami Tamaklo, Bu Asedu, Expedi Olagu, Basil Ibrahim, and Hopalong Babul Kane. We are generously supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and receive research assistance from Cornell University and the University of California, Riverside. Our music is courtesy of Kevin McLeod. Until next week, Safiri Salama.